Right, hello everyone. For our network security course, this week's lecture is about computer networks and the internet. So these these slides are actually from adapted from the chapter two of this book uh, by Croze Ross. Uh, the computer networking, a top-down approach. I think maybe the eighth edition might be out right now, but there isn't much difference between these editions anyway. So most of the slides are also for, adapted from this book and the uh, other uh, media provided by this book. So so far we concluded almost every topic in the area of cryptology. So we have the basic stuff to obtain security. Now we can talk about networks. So our goal for this week is to become familiar to the following concepts like basic terminology of networking, conceptual implementation aspects of network application protocols, including transport layer service models, client-server paradigm, peer-to-peer -peer paradigm, and so on. Also, the, we want to become familiar with the popular application level protocols like HTTP and Socket API. <coughs> what I recommend you is to, since I'm uploading the slides first, I recommend you to read the slides first and maybe listen to these videos but what I strongly recommend is to read the chapter from this book and in this way I really recommend you to finish reading the whole book before the end of the semester because in this kind of topics you can get a lot more information in a book than you can get from a shortened lecture or from material from the internet and so reading the book is always for me more important so let's remind what we have done in the first weeks of this lecture we talk about forms of transmission multiplexing like FTM, TDM and WDM and so on we talk about concept of protocol network structure concepts like network edges network core access network types like DSL cable network enterprise access networks and we talk about types of Ethernet other computer networking communication standards. We also talk about wireless access networks and we talk about the standards in these topics. And then we talk about network core concepts like packets switching, store and forward, queuing, delay, loss, routing and forwarding. And uh, we should be able to answer the following questions about popular wireless internet technologies today, the calculation of end-to-end -end delay between a sending host and a receiving host given the transmission rates and assuming store and forward packet switching. And we also need to answer the questions about the differences between the time division multiplexing, FTM, WDM and so on. So also at the end of this lecture, you'll be able to ask questions about the role of content network provides in the internet structure, specific types of end-to-end -end delay, network protocol layers and their functions, network application architectures, circuits, transport layer protocols like TCP and UDP, and application layer protocols like HTTP. So let's talk about, to first talk about the internet structure. Actually, there is two ways of looking to the internet. One is actually the hardware approach, because here we are actually connecting a lot of devices to each other. So there should be a hardware infrastructure for this, right? There should be routers and cables and so on. So one way of looking at the Internet is this. But the other way is to look as like a, like a software-oriented approach, is to look at the services that you obtain, like, for instance, you are checking your email, but while doing this, you never consider how your devices connect to the, the email server and so on, right? You only look at the software part of this process. So let's look at it in the first, in a hardware-oriented way and see how we can connect all of these devices and create an international network. So network ends, in other words, end users connect to internet via access internet service providers that we shorten as ISPs. An internet service provider wired or wireless con provides wired or wireless connectivity using DLS, Wi-Fi, cellular, etc. So an ISP does not have to be a company, 
Universities are ISPs that provide Ethernet and Wi-Fi connectivity, like our university, which provides, which acts like an internet service provider. So, access ISPs in turn must be interconnected so that any two hosts can send packets to each other. Resulting network of networks is complex. Evolution was driven by economics and national policies. So, how do we connect all of these? access networks to each other because we are given millions of access ISPs the connecting them is not easy if you connect each access ISP to each other directly then this becomes uh, you know O N square connections because uh, you have N access points and you have to connect each of them you if you take the combination of N by 2 then you get you know n square minus n which is actually in the big O notation O n square so you know you cannot do that because n is a really big number so another idea is to connect each access ISP to a global transit internet service provider customer and provider ISPs have economic agreement so this looks like a better solution but again it is hard to scale because uh, if one global ISP is viable business, there will be competitors which must be interconnected. So we should be, we should have global internet service providers, and they should be connected to each other, which we call internet exchange point. Actually, and more importantly, then we have regional networks because they arise to connect access nets to ISPs. Then. We have content provider networks like Google, Microsoft, etc. And they may run their own network to bring services and content close to end users because now it's Google really big that they have, they need a faster connection because they have different servers in different countries and so on. So the picture becomes more complicated. So another way to look at it is this. So at the center, a small number of well-connected large networks Tier 1 commercial internet service providers like Level 3, Sprint, AT&T or NTT and national, they provide national and international coverage. Content provider networks like Google, they have private network that connects data centers to internet, often bypassing Tier 1 regional ISPs. So this is actually how the internet structure is actually. So most of the time our, at our homes we have an access, we connect to internet to an access ISP, we go to the regional ISP, maybe to tier 1 ISP, then this one connects us to the web page or the service that we are trying to reach. Now we, let's talk about measures because during this connection there may be delay, loss and we are interested in the throughput in networks and we are also interested in protocol layers. So how do loss and delay occur? Let's start with that. Packets go in router buffers. Packet arrival rate to link temporarily exists to output link capacity. Packets queue wait for turn. So the idea is as follows. Once the router receives the packets, if the rate is not that much, then it directly sends this packets and so there is no queue. But if the demand is too big, then there should be a queuing here. And the routers have some kind of buffer, and it, it, you have some free buffers at the end. Arriving, arriving packets dropped if no free buffers. So if you fill all of the buffers here, then the arriving packets will be dropped. Actually, this is the kind of thing happens during the denial of service attacks, if you are attacking the router. So there are four sources of packet delay. So we have to focus on all of them. So a delay in the node actually is the sum of all of the delays in all of these four sources. So we divided them into nodal processing, queuing delay, transmission delay, and propagation delay. So let's start with nodal processing. So here the node receives your packets, but 
it first checks for bit errors. And here the, the coding theory comes into play and check if the messages are correctly received. If not, uh, they are corrected depending on the uh, error correcting capacity of the code that it is used. But then, uh, if they cannot correct all of the errors but detect that there is an error, so they ask for a retransmission. So, typically, this process is less than milliseconds, so uh, most of the delay does not come from this nodal processing. So, most of the time, we have to look at the other sources of packet delay. So, let's look at the second one called queuing delay. This is the time waiting at output link for transmission. Depends on congestion level for level of router, so it depends on uh, the demand. I mean, it depends on how fast you are receiving data from these uh, nodes and how fast you can then transmit them. If this part exceeds this part, then there will be some queuing. So you have to wait for this packet to be transmitting. So this is why you get some delay here which we denote as DQ. The third one is transmission delay. So let's say that L is the packet length in bits. So we are receiving packets in L bits. And your bandwidth here, the capacity of your actual node is R. So R is the number of bits per second that you can transmit. So this means that transmission delay is just L divided by R. So if L exceeds R, then this means that there should be a huge delay. And the last part is propagation delay. So this propagation delay comes from this physical link. So if you are sending this data from Wi-Fi, then your Wi-Fi transmission speed comes into play. If this is a wire connection, then we have to check the capacity of this connection which we already talked about in our first week. So let's say that D is the length of the physical link, S is the propagation speed in the medium, so the delay here is D over S. And some people think that these two delays are somewhat the same, but actually as we already defined what they are, so you can see that they are two different things, okay? because one of them might be the bottleneck and the other one is not. So you have to be careful about these two different definitions. So maybe you have, a, for instance, think about an example like this. You have a, from your internet service provider, you pay the money and receive a very fast internet connection. Let's say that it is like 100 megabits per second. But the router you are using at your home is just, uh, you know, 50 megabits per second. So delay doesn't come from this propagation, but it comes from this uh, transmission. And the similar thing it can happen vice versa. Okay. In order to show this difference, there is a caravan analogy here. Suppose that cars propagated 100 kilometers per hour. Assume that the tall boot here takes 12 seconds to service a car. So this is bit transmission time. So you can hear the analogies as follows. Cars are bits, caravans are packets. So the 10 car group is called a caravan. Question, how long until caravan is lined up before the second tool boot? So the time to push the entire caravan through the tall boot on the highway is 12 seconds time since there are 10 cars it is 120 seconds now all of these cars uh, go from here to here but since their speed is 100 kilometers per hour it will take an hour for the last car to come from here to here so the time for the last car to propagate from the first to the second boot is this one hour so answer is taking all of these cars from here to here takes 62 minutes. So as you can see, here the transmission rate was really fast, so delay doesn't come from the transmission, but it comes from here, so which we call the propagation. 
Let's uh, switch the example. Now suppose that car is now 10 times faster. Also suppose that the toll booth now takes one minute to service a car. So we increase the propagation rate but reduce the transmission rate. So the question is, will cars arrive to the second boot before all cars service at the first boot? So answer is yes. After seven minutes, because you know it takes like uh, one minute to be serviced here, and it takes like uh, one tenth of an hour to reach first car to move from here to here, which is six minutes. So after seven minutes, this car is comes from here to here, but there are other cars still here to be transmitted. So as you can see. In this case, the delay comes from the transmission, not from the propagation. So after seven minutes, the first car arrives at the second boot, but three cars still at the first boot here, waiting to be transmitted. So, as you can see, these two delay delays are important, and most of the time, delays are coming from these two. Unless, of course, you are not under a denial of service attack, if you are having this kind of attack, the queuing will be also the, your main result for the delays. So, let's look at the queuing delay. We talk that R is the link bandwidth, so it is bits per second, and L is the packet length. So, let's say that A is the average packet arrival rate. So, this means that the queuing delay will be measured by A times L divided by R because L is the packet length and on average you are receiving A packets in a second. So if this number is close to zero, then there is almost no delay because the node sends everything it receives initially. But once this number increases and it starts to reach one, as in this graph, you know, the queuing delay becomes large. As you can see, it's increasing exponentially. But if this number is greater than 1, then more work is arriving than can be serviced. So, you know, since this graph goes to infinity, you can uh, imagine that the delay will be infinite. And since you have limited amount of buffers, uh, you will have a lot of packets drops after some point on. So internet delays and routes, let's talk about this. The trace route program provides delay measurement from source to router along end-to-end -end internet paths towards destination. So for all routers I, it sends three packets that will reach router I on path towards destination. The router I will return packets to sender. The sender reports the time intervals between transmission and reply. So here's you and here's probably the web page you want to visit. So you are sending three packets to all of the routers and routers send you back. And uh, of course some routers may not choose to uh, send this information back to you to maybe prevent some denial of service attacks and so on, but most of them do. And you get this kind of uh, results at the end. And there is for Windows there is another command that you can use in the command prompt too. So you will you can also have this kind of result using Windows. So here's an example. So here the trace route for some web page from this university to this French web page. So as you can see the initial delay measurements are really slow uh, really fast because here you are at the university and uh, university is an internet source provider so you are directly connected to them and you your information reached to the routers in a few milliseconds then from here to here as you can see you are following actually 19 routers to reach the web page that you want to visit and as you can see some measurements are really small but some of them kind of 10 times larger than the previous ones. Here this is happens because the university here is in United States and the web page is in France. So you have to pass the ocean to reach the Europe. So this is why uh, there is a little bit more delay here because here you are leaving United States and reaching Europe. Okay. And uh, 
if some of these relatives are under an attack or the queue is really large, then the numbers can increase really high, like a few seconds instead of milliseconds. As you can see, sometimes some routers does not send you back or maybe it is lost during the transmission, so this means that no response, probe lost, router not replying. Some routers, as I told you, might choose to not reply. So, packet lost. The queue, also known as buffer, has a finite capacity because you cannot put infinite memory to any device. The packet arriving to a full queue is dropped. In other words, it is lost. The lost packet may be retransmitted by a previous node, by a source and the, by a source and the system, or not at all. So, you know, so if you sometimes if your packet is lost or you don't receiving anything, then next thing you do most of the time try to be connected. You know, you send the retransmission by yourself. If the buffer is full, the packets you send is directed lost. It is dropped. So, next topic that we need to talk about is throughput. Throughput is like the is the rate which is measured as bits over time units and it is the rate at which bits transferred between the sender and the receiver. Instantaneous throughput is the rate at a given point in time. Average throughput the rate over a longer period of time. So look at it in this way. Server sends bits and it's referred to as fluid into a pipe. This is an this time a fluid analogy. This is the pipe that can carry fluid at rate RS bits per second. Then here is another pipe, since we are jumping from router to router. And this pipe actually uh, transmits the fluid at a rate RC bits per second. So we want to see what is the throughput depending on these two different pipes. Okay. So let's determine the bottleneck link, which is the link on end-to-end -end path that constrains end-to-end -end throughput. So look at it in this way. Assume that RS is less than RC. So first pipe is small, but the second pipe is large. Okay, so question is, what is the average end-to-end -end throughput? That is, how many bits per second you can send from here to here. And if we change the places of the pipes, again, what is the average? So, actually the answer to this will be the, the minimum in both cases. Okay, In this case it is RS, and in this case it is RC. But let's look at a bigger picture. So, let's talk about an internet scenario. Peer connection and trend throughput is the minimum of RC. RS and R divided by 10. So in this scenario we have 10 computers connect to this pipe and 10 connections fairly share backbone bottleneck link R bits per second. So you know, since you, already, you have 10 connections the transmission rate is from here to here is R over 10 at this point. Here all of them are connected with pipes that can support RC bits per second. And from here, the servers you have connection speed of RS. So in overall, the, your throughput is actually the minimum of RC, RS, or R divided by 10. But in practice, RC or S is often the bottleneck, as you might imagine, because the internet service providers today has a huge capacity. So let's talk about protocol layers and see how the internet protocols work. Networks are complex with many components. We have hosts, routers, links of various media, applications, hardware and software. So protocols help organizing network structure. The idea is many actions are composed of a series of steps. Consider organization of an air travel. So here is an analogy for a airplane travel. And let's see how it kind of matches with the network protocols. So 
Let's think about this. So you buy your ticket, you check your baggages, you go to gates and you know passengers are loaded into the plane. The plane takes take off. The airplane is now routing and then it lands at the gate it unloads the passengers. You go to claim your baggage and then if there's a problem you go to the ticket place and complain about your travel. So you know there are a lot of steps and there are a lot of parameters so it's a complex structure. In order for this to work, airline functionality can be studied in terms of layers. So uh, for the, this part it is related, considered as ticket layer, this part comes, can be seen as baggage layer, gate layer, takeoff landing layer and airplane routing layer. So each layer implements a service by its own internal layer actions and relying on services provided by layer below. So this way it is it becomes more manageable and easy to solve when there are problems in any of the layers. So let's see the internet protocol stack in a similar way. So generally we divide it into these five layers application, transport, network, link and physical. So at the application layer, this is supporting network applications, for example FTP, SMTP, HTTP, DNS, and packets at this layer are called messages. At the transport layer, the transport application layer messages between application endpoints, for example TCP, UDP, and here the packets are called segments. At the network layer, this layer moves network layer packets from one host to another. Packets at this layer are called the datagrams and, at the, and routing of datagrams from source to destination through a series of routers, for example IP, routing protocols. The IP protocol defines fields in a datagram package. And the last two are link and physical. At the link layer, data transfer between neighboring network elements, for example Ethernet, Wi-Fi and packets at this layer are called frames. Physical layer is actually moves individual bits on the wire. So this is actually the hardware point of the uh, protocol. ISO and OC reference model adds a few more layers. Here you have layers like presentation and session. And at the presentation layer, this allows applications to interpret meaning of data, for example, encryption, compression, machine-specific conventions. At the session layer, you have synchronization, checkpointing, recovery of data exchange. And system hosts, routers and link layer switches organize their network, hardware, software into layers. Hosts implement all five layers. Routers and link layer switches implement bottom layers. So link layer switches implement layer 1, physical and layer 2, link layer. And link layer switches do not recognize layer 3, for example IP addresses, but layer 2 Ethernet addresses. So this way you they don't have to care about which IP they need to communicate and so on. Routers implement layers 1, 2 and 3. So this is why they are interested in IPs. And the Internet architecture puts its complexity at network edges, in other words, hosts. So here is then how this works and how we encapsulate every message. So here you are and you are using an application and this application sends some message to the server, let's say, to communicate. So your message is M. But this is at the application layer and this is called message. So at the transport layer, we put an header to it which actually tells you which uh, transport layer it wants to communicate here. So here you put it to HD and it becomes a segment. You put another header at the network layer and it becomes a datagram. At the link layer you put the link layer header and becomes a frame. So actually this header Tells the uh, tells which uh, where this data is going to at the link layer. So once you send it to the switch, 
the switch doesn't have the network or upper layer upper layers so it has only link and physical so at the link layer you are actually telling where it is going a physical layer is actually the wire from here to here so at the link layer the switch understands now where to send this data so it sends us to this router and since routers have the network layer they now know which IP address they need to send this to and they generally find the shortest path from here to this server and send this uh, message to from here to the server so as you can see here since we are at the network layer the router actually goes from here to here so uh, it's due to encapsulation it's kind of opens this message and then re-encapsulates it and sends it to the server and at the destination all of the steps are uh, applied from bottom to top and the application now receives the messages important thing is that here the applications actually doesn't care about the other layers uh, all of these parts is actually most of the time performed by the operating system so this is a good thing because when you are implementing an application or providing a service you don't have to deal with all of these layers all you are interested is at this point and the rest is magically done for you okay let's move on to network applications so for example network applications we can give easy examples like email web text messaging remote logging peer-to-peer -peer file sharing multi-user network games streaming stored video like what I'm doing right now like for example YouTube voice over IP like Skype or real-time video conferencing and so on. and the network applications the goal is to write network application programs that run on different end systems communicate over network for example web server software communicates with browser software this is important because not everybody are using the same computer the same operating system and so on so your application uh, should be compatible with many different uh, operating systems or softwares because even every browser are different but you can visit a web page with almost every browser so application software is confined to end systems there's no need to write software for network core devices network core devices do not run user applications they do not function at the application layer so application layer is only at the source and the destination so there is a client if you look at the network application architecture there's a client server architecture so server side features are like this so service is always on host it's most of the time has a permanent IP address and maybe they're in possibly data centers for scaling client features communication communicate with server clients may be intermittently connected to server because sometimes you just turn off your computer sometimes even if it is turned on you don't use the service all the time you connect to the server whenever you want clients may have dynamic IP addresses like we all do at our homes and they do not communicate directly with each other so this is one of the important things for instance when you are using many applications like whatsapp or any messaging service like Instagram and so on when you send a message to your friend you are not connecting to your friend so you are both clients and you are not directly sending data to each other instead you are sending the data to the server and the server sends it back to your friend so uh, this is why clients don't have direct connection to each other peer-to-peer -peer architecture in this case no always on server exists so you don't rely on a server in this case arbitrary end systems host directly communicate and in this case we call them peers peers request service from other peers provide service in return to other peers self scalability new peers bring new service capacity as well as new service demands so you know that this is how uh, file sharing applications work 
and peers are intermittently connected and change IP addresses so it is it becomes a complex it becomes complex to manage and since this is decentralized security issues arises from time to time but today as you know torrents and similar kind of services work in this way process is communicating so process is a program running within a host it is said that processes not programs communicate within same host two processes communicate using inter-process communication defined by the operating system and processes in different hosts communicate by exchanging messages applications with peer-to-peer -peer architectures have both client processes and server processes so client process actually initiates the communication server processes uh, are the processes that wait to be contacted so a web page is an easier example for this the web page always waits for you to come connect to it and you can connect to a web page whenever you want so you are initiating the communication and they are always waiting to be contacted so at this point another uh, concept comes into play that we call sockets a socket is an interface between a process and the network a process sends messages to its socket analogous, analogous to a door a process receives messages from its socket again analogous to a door the sending process pushes a message out the door the sending process relies on transport infrastructure on other side of door to deliver message to socket at receiving process so at the application layer you have a process and you kind of have a socket here and you are actually telling which socket at the destination you are sending the message to so through the internet you send your data in this way again but at this point operating system knows which socket you send the data so it sends it to it so the process can read the data and perform any operation that it wants to here is an another picture for that application processes sockets and underlying transport protocol so you have the your either host or server it doesn't matter you have a process it has a socket and by the operating system it is actually controlled in this way addressing processes so to receive messages a process must have an identifier question does an IP address of the host on which process runs suffice for identifying the process and the answer is no because many processes can be running on the same host so the IP address is not enough to determine which process the data is addressed to so the identifier includes both IP address and port numbers associated with process on host so example port numbers are for the HTTP servers 80 and mail servers 25 of course this is most of the time when it is unencrypted for the encrypted mail servers you generally have something starting with 900 something for the ports so you can check this web page for a set of well-known port numbers for all internet standard protocols so let's sum up the transport layer protocols a circuit is the interface between the application process and the transport layer protocol the sending application pushes messages through the circuit and the transport layer protocol on the receiving side gets the message to the circuit of the receiving process so this is how you communicate between applications so I think this is a good time good place to stop and I will continue for in the second hour from here